Great. All right, well, everybody, welcome once again um, to, again, we've had a name change. If this is your first time hearing about that, we're really excited to announce that the Open Textbook Network is now the op Open Education Network to reflect um, kind, of a, a, kind of a wider array of the work that we all do here. So welcome. We're very, very excited uh, about today's webinar, which is There's No 10% Rule, and it's a good thing, too. Loving the title on that one. We are joined today by Will Cross, the Director of Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at, the, at North Carolina State University, as well as Carla Myers, the Assistant Librarian and Coordinator of Scholarly Communication at Miami University of Ohio. So without further ado, I will let you all take it from here and also introduce your colleagues that will be joining us today. Oh, hi, welcome everybody. Um, I'm so excited to be back here again to present with Will on behalf of the Open Education Network um, and to talk with you about Fair Miss. Before we dive in, we are going to have two guest presenters joining us today. I will let Meredith and Peter introduce themselves. Meredith, do you want to go first? Sure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Meredith Jacob and I work at the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property at American University's Law School, and I'm also the public lead for Creative Commons United States. That's a long title that basically means I end up spending a lot of time talking to uh, librarians and professors and teachers about the intersection between copyright, uh, open licensing like Creative Commons, and the creation of OER. So I'm so glad to join you. Thanks. Thanks, Meredith. And Peter, if you would like to introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm a retired copyright professor also from American University. And for 20 years or so, I've been kind of specializing in, in fair use as a subject. And I've also been involved for 15 or so of those years in this process of creating fair use best practices documents for different practice communities, which I'll be talking about a little more later on. Thank you for having me. We're so excited to have both of you here with us. Um, so we are going to dive right in today, just because we want to make sure we are able to leave some time at the end for questions. So if we could have the next slide, please. We want to start off by talking about what is fair use in general. We're not going to dive too deeply into this um, for the sake of time and making sure that we can have plenty of time to take questions at the end. But also because uh, we did a presentation on this a couple weeks ago during the OTN Summit this year. So we very much encourage people to go back and take a look at that for kind of an in-depth exploration of what fair use is. If we can have the next slide, please. So some things that fair use is generally, um, it's a safety valve for free expression. So sometimes if we take a look at copyright, and if you read it at its face, it seems very, very strict. Um, the idea that even making a copy and sharing that with somebody else, whether it's as small as a quote or maybe a copy of a picture, that technically we're not allowed to do that without breaking the law. That can kind of seem very restrictive and intimidating, but then we have user rights worked into the law, like fair use, which were added in there by Congress to kind of be that safety valve to say, well, wait, there's some situations where people might need to be able to reuse works in certain situations, and we want to make sure those opportunities are available to them. It is equitable, but it's codified in the statutes. So here the idea of equity can be that each fair use determination is taken a look at based on the facts of that particular situation. And I think that's one of the things um, with many of the myths we're going to explore or that we hear, they kind of seem to be absolute sometimes. And that's not exactly how fair use works. That it takes a look more at what are the specific facts of a particular situation and how are we going to interpret the law within those facts. It is an exceptional exception found in the law. 
I think I say that because fair use is available for everybody. There are some user rights like Section 108 that is only available to libraries and archives. We have Section 1101, which takes, which takes a look at not-for-profit educational institutions or government organizations. So some of the exceptions or user rights that we find in the law, they're kind of limited to certain groups, but fair use is available to everybody. And something Will and I really wanted to emphasize is that fair use is a positive right that's available to us. It is not some incidental loophole found within the law. Um, it is just not something there just in case. It is a positive right that we see consistently held up by the courts when it's applied thoughtfully and fairly to particular situations. And something I've seen recently too is this idea that fair use is a concession by the rights holders. That um, I encountered a rights holder who said, well, in this situation, we're going to let you use fair use. And my reaction was, well, that, that's kind of not how it works. I don't need your permission to make a fair use. This is granted to me in the law. Um, so that being, um, it, it's not a loophole. It's a positive right that's available to everybody. And can we have the next slide, please? Carla, I think Barb dropped off the call with a slide, oh, so I'll have no. a look for you. Uh, okay. But carry on. Um, so fair use, um, the thing we most often talk about with fair use is the four statutory factors of fair use. Um, again, we're just going to kind of go through these briefly. We have, of course, what is the purpose of our use? Why are we looking to reuse a particular work under this user right? Uh, factor number two, what is the nature of the work? What is the nature of the work that we're looking to reuse? Is it more of a factual work? Is it more of a really creative work of fiction? Um, is it just a picture of a tree somebody snapped while they were out taking for a walk? Is it an abstract painting of a tree that has a lot of creativity into it? So what is the nature of that work? Um, the factor that everybody loves to hate, and I feel bad for it for this reason, factor number three, what is the amount that we are looking to reuse? And then factor number four, what is the potential effect on the market for a particular use? And something interesting I think we see is a lot of myths that spring up around these factors kind of individually, um, or that can kind of pop up around fair use as a whole. So these four factors of fair use, very critical to thinking through all of them when it comes to making fair use determinations, but each one of these factors can have their own particular myths that arise as a result of them. Um, and then something we wanted to talk about as well, because I think it's going to come out a little bit as we talk about the myths, is transformation. What is a transformative fair use? Um, I think this is something that kind of among librarians or educators, we're starting to see a lot more dialogue around. So the idea of something that we're taking something out of its original context and transforming it into a new particular use. I think we see this very often in libraries and educational situations where maybe something was originally written for an entertainment purpose. Um, maybe it is a work of fiction. Maybe, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's the Aragon series by Christopher Pellini. And we take that out of an entertainment context and put it in an educational context. Something we see specifically cited in the Fair Use Statute is providing criticism or commentary on a work to glean new meaning from it. And I think we constantly do that, whether it's in the classroom and we're dissecting some type of work, whether it's a painting or a film or a novel, to get new insight into it. Um, or maybe it's a, a movie, it's a popcorn movie that we now want to take a look at in a scholarly context in a film course to kind of dissect it in that capacity. Um, there's our slides, fantastic, thank you so much. So I love this image here of, you know, the transformation from the caterpillar into the butterfly, that we have this original work and through transformation, we turn it into something new and beautiful. Um, and these are some famous quotes from um, scholars talking about transformation or court cases, is taking a look at whether the new work that we create under fair use just merely supersedes the original creation, or it adds something new, altering the expression or the meaning of the message. Um, so again, a very brief overview, but we wanted to talk about these things to give some context for uh, discussing the myths when it comes to fair use. So Will, um, we both with, work with fair use very constantly, copyright, and it feels like at least once a week I hear one of these myths. And a myth, if I had a dollar every time that I heard it, 
um, I, I'd be in a beach house right now, um, is that fair use is an equation that, you know, it's to figure out fair use, we're going to sit down and tally up numbers and dissect it that way. And I wonder if you've heard this myth and your thoughts on it. That's a great question. Thanks, Carla. So 100%. And if we could go on to the next slide, we can we can show the myth and then go from there. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, I understand the attraction of this myth. I wish or I, I understand the desire for a fair use machine where you can like type three buttons and a little card comes out with either like green ink and it says yes, fair use or red ink and it says no, fair use. Um, I, I think I want to, to argue though that not only is it a myth, but it's really, really good that it's a myth. And I think the next slide does a nice way of walking through this. Um, if you've ever heard a, pre a fair use presentation before, you've, you've maybe seen a set of scales presenting the idea that fair use is about balance in some sense. On the last webinar, I talked about the idea that fair use analysis can be like making soup and a judge would sort of taste the soup and it would taste good or not. I think another way into the idea that there's no such thing as a 10% rule and it's a good thing to, is to align this idea that you talked about of an equitable rule, an equitable exception in the sense that it's judge made and that it's flexible in some sense with the idea of equi equity and equitability in the way we tend to talk about it in terms of social justice, right? Um, so equality versus equity is often presented as equality is one person gets one box, no matter who they are, this sort of mechanical one to one to one. And equity, instead of centering on a mechanical, you get this, is it's values driven, right? It's purpose driven. Equity is everybody gets what they need to do the thing they need to do. And you could almost sort of strike through equality here and write like the Teach Act. It's really mechanical. You go into subsection four, Z, seven, or whatever. Um, and if you're the sort of person that they wrote the Teach Act thinking about, the Teach Act works okay for you. But if you're anybody else, it can be a bad fit. Um, equity, on the other hand, I, I'm sort of comparing to fair use here with the idea that it is, instead of being like this person, this thing, mechanical little card, it is what, what are the values we're trying to express here? What's the purpose here? The purpose is that pedagogically, I need to use this image to teach people about history. Okay, well, how much do you need to do that socially valuable thing? So it's focused on the purpose and the values rather than on the sort of the raw numbers or the mechanical operations. And on the next slide, we have a sort of a really nice illustration of the difference between those two approaches. Um, if you've ever heard, perfect, you've got it, just right slide, thank you. Um, if you've ever heard 10% or one chapter or that sort of thing, a lot of those tend to come from these things called the classroom copying guidelines. Um, they are, uh, they're not the law, of course, they reflect a, a fairly different time in a lot of different ways. And it's been a lot of fun to watch the Georgia State Court sort of bat them around and, and demonstrate how bad they are. Um, but it's a perfect reflection of this sort of uh, mechanical approach. 9%, yes, fair use. 11%, no fair use. Um, that's not the way fair use works, and that wouldn't support the sort of teaching that happens, especially in 2020, you know, in the context of the pandemic, in the context of different access to things, etc. Contrast that with the best practices, which are, they reflect the sort of equitable nature. When you think about fair use, ask these kind of questions, weigh these sorts of issues, think about these pivot points, the difference between a sort of mechanical 10%-ish rule and a flexible equitable rule. So that's, that's, I hope, a nice way of thinking about the difference and why the, the latter of those, the equity, the equitable, the, the best practices approach is a better approach in terms of policy and in terms of being more accurate to the law. So that's one way that these, these aren't maybe as mechanical as people sometimes think. Carla, I bet you've heard another version of this, which is sort of the mechanical educational use equals fair use, non-educational commercial use equals not fair use. Have you heard that myth? And if so, how do you respond to it on the next slide? Absolutely. Um, if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, Will, that's a myth that I think I hear very frequently. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So where I hear this tends to be in two different contexts, working at um, a university. Um, very frequently when people initially come to me to talk about copyright, they're like, oh, but it's an educational use and all educational uses are automatically fair uses. Um, or had a really interesting conversation with a young woman earlier this year who was looking to launch a YouTube channel and hoping at some point to be able to monetize the videos that she put online. And she said, well, because I plan on making money off of this, I know there's things that I can't do, like show pictures of different products and things like that. And talking about how kind of another common myth about commercial uses and fair use. 
So who doesn't love educational uses? Everybody loves educational uses, right? And I think that's where we very frequently hear that all educational uses are automatically fair uses. The courts tend to love educational uses when considering the first factor of fair use. Um, if we take a look at some of the different cases that are out there, um, and we had talked a little bit about Georgia State. Um, so even in the Georgia State case, we had the judges talk about that um, teaching uses for not for, teaching uses for not for profit educational uses. Um, that's almost always going to be found as fair under the first factor. But we have to remember that we have those three other factors there as well. And that just merely having the first factor on our side doesn't negate all of those other three factors um, or that it automatically instantly slants it over into a fair use determination. So we do want to work through all those four factors of fair use and do that balance test. Although we can be fairly confident if something is being used in an educational capacity um, if for a not-for-profit educational institution, that it's likely the courts will see that as being fair under the first factor. So something very closely tied to this, um, if you can click on the next button. But I cited it. Um, oh, my little thing went through fast, no worries. Um, so the little cat was saying, but I cited that, and that makes it fair use. It's, I think, very closely tied um, to the idea that all educational uses are fair. And what I tell people in that situation is, I'm so glad to see that you cited your use. Of course, you know, we want to avoid plagiarism. I think as instructors, we want to be modeling the behaviors that we would like to see out of our students, which is, of course, citing when they reuse other people's works. But if you take a look at the fair use statute, it actually says nothing about citing. So citing something doesn't automatically make it a fair use, nor will it negate claims of copyright infringement. It can maybe show some good faith um, that, you know, we were trying to give credit to the person whose work we were reusing, but it doesn't automatically make something fair. So the opposite end of this that Lil had mentioned is that, well, my use is a commercial use, so I can't consider fair use. And that is a myth as well. Um, we have plenty of situations where we've seen cases gone through the courts and that their use is commercial. Maybe um, very frequently we see transformative uses coming into here, that there may be a commercial motive behind the use that they are creating a product that they will sell access to or sell copies of and will make money off of that. But very frequently in those situations, they're also transforming the work that they are reusing. Um, so here we have an example of a case. It's Bill Graham Archives versus DK for our librarians and educators on this call. We're gonna recognize DK right away. DK made this coffee table book um, that explores the history of the Grateful Dead. And they reused some um, concert posters in a very small size within this book. They had gone to the Bill Graham archives. Um, Bill Graham was a concert promoter. He worked very closely with the Grateful Dead. He had tons and tons of their um, concert posters, tickets, all kinds of things in their archive. And they said, we would like to reuse these images. Um, Negotiations kind of fell apart a little bit, but DK ended up using those images anyway. And here, what the courts ended up saying is that um, even though DK's purpose was commercial, including these in the book, that you know they were obviously selling the book to make some money, um, that the use of these images is into, incidental to the commercial biographical value of the book. It is not the key driving force unto itself. Um, so there can absolutely be situations where our use is commercial and our use can be found to be fair. Um, so that's how I very frequently hear those myths and then how I very frequently answer people when they ask those questions. Um, so another thing I'm thinking about, and I was actually just talking with somebody about this this morning, was the idea that the use of fair use and open licenses, it's kind of one or the other, mutually exclusive, um, that we can't have them supporting each other, or if one doesn't work, we can't go to the other. Um, Will, do you ever hear this, and what do you say in these situations? Yeah, thanks, Carla. That's, that's something that I hear a lot, and I, I think sometimes even when we teach about one, we'll sort of demonize the other a little bit. You shouldn't, you know, fair use is scary, so you should just use an open license instead or that sort of thing. Um, 
I think this is maybe the easiest of all the myths to bust. And if we'll go forward, um, one slide you'll see the myth, and then a second slide you'll see sort of the busting of that myth. Um, so, so the myth is that it, fair use is incompatible. Um, and the next slide makes it clear not only is fair use compatible with Creative Commons licenses, it's explicitly anticipated, right? If you dig into the, this is the lawyer readable, not the human readable language, right, but of the CC BY license, um, you'll see they, they say explicitly, if, if you can secure all rights, that's great and that's a wonderful thing to do. But in the case where you need to use something, Thing, and you have to rely on what they say an exception or limitation, which is the sort of the term of art we use for things like fair use. Um, that's fine to do as long as you do what it says on the next slide, offer clear marking for this stuff. Um, and again, you can tell this is anticipated because there's this whole toolkit on how to clearly mark stuff relying on fair use in openly licensed materials. So if, if we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, fair use is actually pretty too easy to use in the context of open licenses. Um, so, so I think that's a, that's a myth sort of quickly busted maybe. Uh, another maybe piece of that conversation that you've alluded to, Carla, but I'd love it if you could spell out a little more, is the relationship between the way rights holders talk about fair use and the, the ways that we can rely on fair use. I've heard this myth sometimes on the next slide that fair use is defined by rights holders either directly because they will quote, give you permission to use fair use and we see that sometimes, or that, that if they offer a license at any price in any way that that somehow forecloses fair use. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between what right, rights holders are doing and what we've called the positive right of fair use looks like. Absolutely, um, if we can go on to the next slide please. So sometimes, and Will, I, I welcome you to give some thoughts on this. Even those of us who have been working for the, with fairies for a long time, sometimes we're really on the fence. Like, mm, I really think maybe this could be a fair use, but it's a little bit of a stretch. And one thing I tell people is when they find themselves in that situation, let's reach out to the rights holder and talk to them. You know, if, if we're really thinking this might not be a fair use, um, let's reach out to the rights holder and see if we can get their permission. And sometimes it ends up being a bad connection. So there have been situations where I have helped people reach out to a rights holder. Um, and they offer licensed terms, but for some reason, those terms that they are offering us do not work. Um, maybe they're not, they're too narrow for our particular situation. Or maybe they want to give us the license to use something in some capacity, but they say, I'm only giving you this license for one year. Well, we want to include this in a book, and we kind of can't recall all these copies of a book after one particular year. So sometimes when we reach out to rights holders, we just have a bad connection when it comes to particular terms um, of that license. Other times we reach out to rights holders, we have lots of conversations in good faith and things seem to be going really, really well. And then out of nowhere, we have this fee that really kind of shocks us and is unscalable for us, either as libraries or educational institutions or even individuals. I once worked with a faculty member who was looking to use some images from an archive in their book. And um, I had helped him reach out to the archive about, you know, using these in the book because we were kind of on the fence about fair use. And uh, the first thing they said is we're more than happy to grant that for $500 an image. And he was like, whoa, I, I can't afford that. Um, and, and I went back and said, you know, here we're dealing with an author and they might be able to get some money from their department. But, you know, this is really kind of unscalable for us at this particular price. So there was lots of good intent involved, but we all know what library and educational institution budgets are, or even as individual authors, um, that we have those financial limitations in place. Sometimes a license can be flat out denied, that we reach out to somebody and we just get a resounding no. Um, sometimes those are, I don't license anything, I don't want to talk to you. One time I got a no and later the rights holder said, you know, I just didn't even know how to have that conversation and I didn't want to look like I didn't know what I was talking about, so I just said no, kind of as a defense mechanism. So sometimes the license is flat out denied to us. Um, or kind of like the situation I mentioned earlier where I saw some rights holders saying, well, this is what fair use is and you can do this and we're telling you this is a fair use. So when we find ourselves in one of these situations where there's a license and the terms don't work or the fee's not scalable or the license is flat out denied, um, can fair use still be considered in that situation? And the answer is absolutely. 
Now, again, like some of the other myths, if one of these situations applies, it doesn't mean, well, it's automatically a fair use because I couldn't afford it. What that means is we may be able to go back in and um, factor this information into our fair use determination. And we've seen a couple different court cases where this has happened. Um, so there's Feist v. Rural, which has to do with um, entries in a telephone book. And that uh, one group wanted to license entries from another. They were denied. They went ahead and used those entries anyway. Um, this one went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court talked about fair uses. Um, Campbell v. Acuff Rose. This had to do with the use of the um, song, Oh Pretty Woman, um, turned into a rap parody. And initially there were just some of the discussions between the band and the rights holder and that kind of fell apart. Um, and they went ahead and put the rap parody out anyway and that was found to be a fair use. Or even the Bill Graham Archives VDK um, case that we talked about earlier. Those negotiations fell apart as well. But DK factored that information into their analysis and went ahead and used it anyway. And again, their use was found to be a fair use. So when we find ourselves in one of these situations, they don't get to dictate to us what fair use is, or they don't get to say, well, um, if you're not agreeing to this price, I'm saying you can't use fair use. When we find ourselves in one of these situations, we can factor this information into a fair use determination, especially in those situations, kind of like we talked about earlier, uh, where fair use might really be protecting our right to free speech or promoting criticism or commentary on a particular work. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Sometimes there is no connection. We just get that dial tone. Um, there's no way to get through to the rights holders. These could be orphan work considerations. Um, so orphan works, they can kind of occur in one of two ways. We don't know who the rights holder is. We might want to use a particular work. We're kind of on a defense about fair use. We think about, hmm, well, maybe we want to see if we can go get permission but we don't know who created the work. Maybe their name is not attached to the work originally. Maybe their name fell off at some point in the way the work was reshared. Um, maybe it was written by somebody and we know who they are, but then we have suspicion they might have transferred the rights to somebody else like a publisher. And now that publisher has gone out of business. So we don't have somebody to contact to see who might be the rights holder. Um, were those rights reverted to the original uh, author? Did they stay with the publisher? What's going on? So when we don't know who the rights holder is, um, we want to do a little bit of investigation to see if we can figure that out. But if we can't figure out who it is, going back and factoring that into our fair use analysis, that we made a good faith effort to try to figure out who the rights holder might be, that was unsuccessful. So how can that apply to our application of fair use? Or sometimes, we know who the rights holder is, but we're not able to get a hold of them. We don't have an email address. We don't have a phone number. Or we try reaching out to people and there's no answer via the modes of communication that we found. In those situations, we can go back and consider that information as part of a new fair use analysis. Um, so it's not defined or limited by the rights holders. It's defined by the law and we want to act within that particular scope. Um, so two more very common misconceptions that I hear. Um, another one that I frequently hear is, well, okay, I've made my fair use determination, but what about downstream users? You know, what does this mean for them? Um, Will, do you get that question? And if so, what do you say to people who find themselves in that situation? I, I do. Thanks, Carla. And I, I think this really gets to the crux of a lot of people's sort of struggle wrestling with fair use is a sense that, that I, I might feel confident in myself, but open is so much about the community and I don't want to set somebody else up to have to be in a bad situation because something I did that that downstream use the ability to sort of take and rebuild and remix is so central to what we do um, so on the next slide we have this myth this this I think genuine and sincere concern I don't want to set some I don't either want to get in trouble for what somebody else did or set somebody else up to get in trouble because of what I did um, and I think the first half of that concern is is pretty easy to answer on the next slide um, chances are, are pretty darn slim that you're going to get in trouble for downstream use of your stuff. Um, I've, I've pulled some language here in terms of disclaimers and warranties and no endorsement and that sort of thing, um, but also just the doctrine itself, um, contributory liability and vicarious liability and all those words that if you, like me, are of a certain age and were super into Napster, heard a lot, um, they're, they're not likely to apply in this content. So I wouldn't lose too much sleep about the, am I going to get in trouble for what somebody else does piece of it? 
The reverse, though, on the next slide, I, I, I want to suggest you shouldn't be as concerned about as you might be, but, but I think this is really where the rubber meets the road for a lot of people. Am I setting somebody else up for trouble? And so at first, I, I want to recognize that the validity of the concern and the impulse to protect other people using your stuff. Um, but secondly, to sort of to go back to the, the marking stuff that we talked about earlier, the things we can do when we rely on fair use to make sure we're not setting anybody else up for trouble are, are these things here. First, clear communication about what is and is not licensed. And that's what the marking does. And so, so sort of continuing to contribute to the norm that you should actually read and understand these licenses and say, oh, this is licensed CC BY, but this image that was necessary for historical critique was used under fair use, right? That's the first thing we can do so nobody feels blindsided. The second thing we can do is, is remind folks that third party materials that are not openly licensed might merit a closer look. Um, this is my thing, use it in the way the license permits you to do. This is not my thing, I incorporated it under fair use, so be thoughtful about that in your own context. The, the sort of saving grace piece of that, or the other piece I'd add to that, is that if I think something is fair use in the context of non-commercial educational use in a, a college level course, and somebody downstream is also using something non-commercially educationally in a college level course, they should take their own look at fair use, but downstream uses that are really similar are often going to come out pretty much the same as well, right? Because it's a very, very similar fair use analysis just being done in slightly different contexts. So, so always think about your own context, but recognize one, that, that similar uses are gonna look similar in terms of fair use, and two, if Carla thought something was fair use, my good faith belief in that fair use doing something similar is strengthened. So in some sense, at every, in every um, sort of link in the chain of downstream use strengthens the fair use a little, analysis a little bit because, hey, all these other people thought it was fair use. I considered for myself and I made my own decision, but I was reassured by the fact that all these people I respect also considered it to be fair use. That, that strengthens our argument in, I think, some substantial ways as well. So that's, that's the way I would think about those issues, sort of recognizing the care that we want to take for the community and then recognizing the things that we can do when we rely on fair use to make sure everybody knows what's happening and everybody is being thoughtful about those issues. And I think if we do those, we're not really setting other people up for trouble, um, but maybe we'll come back to this in the Q&A in a little bit as well. Another flavor of this, Carla, that I wanted to ask you about is the downstream user who doesn't get to do their own fair use analysis because they're not in a jurisdiction that has fair use in the first place. Somebody up in Canada saying, this sounds awesome if you've got fair use. We have this thing called fair dealing instead. What do we do? So my question to you, Carla, is how do you think about downstream users that aren't necessarily in the United States or can't for some reason rely on fair use as we've been talking about it so far? On the next slide. I love that question, Well, um, I think especially within the context of OER, this idea of making them available worldwide for people to engage with. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so this idea that fair use only works if you're in the United States and otherwise you are just stuck. Yes and no. Um, so we do have fair use here in the United States. And as Will had mentioned that there are other countries who have fair dealing, which is a very close cousin to fair use, um, but not exactly the same, um, but very close. So if a country is a signatory of the Berne Convention, which is an international treaty that I think um, Peter could probably give me the exact number. It's like 173 or 178 different countries are part of. So part of this is having standardization of our laws. So for example, if a country is a member of the Berne Convention, then they have agreed that their minimum term of copyright protection will be life plus 50 years. Now we see some countries that have life plus 50. We see some countries like the United States that have life plus 70 years as a term of protection. We have some countries like Mexico that have life plus 100 years as a term of protection. So everybody kind of has a minimum standard, but then each country might tweak that a little bit. One of the requirements of the Berne Convention is that signatories have an exception written into their law for educational uses. So not every member country is going to have fair use exactly like we have it, but they are going to have some type of educational exception in the law 
and that people in different countries can look to that educational exception that is within the scope of their law and see how their use might fit in that. So I think the worldwide use consideration is a very, very valid one, especially given the type of exposure that we hope the OER that we create have. Um, but very frequently, most countries are going to have some type of educational um, exception available to them, even if it's not exactly fair use within the way that we're familiar with it in the United States, that should encourage or promote their particular use or that they can use when looking to reuse third party works. So that option is there. Um, so all these different myths are coming at us or, you know, just in talking with people, these myths can sometimes actually make a fair use analysis more complicated. And well, what, what do you say when people say to you, you know what, this is just too complicated. I don't even know how to deal with it. Where do I start? Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. That's a great question, Carla. And, and I think this has been a, a lot of the the impetus for people so far to say, we're, we're just not gonna wrestle with fair uses. I, maybe you're right, and this has all been persuasive, but my head is spinning a little bit. Isn't it just simpler to not worry about it in the first place and remove the complexity? And I wanna suggest two things. First, I wanna suggest it's, it's not as complex, especially in the negative way as it might seem. And second, however complex you think it is, it is not better to stick with only openly licensed materials. So on the, on the next slide, I'll make sort of the first part of that, of that argument or that suggestion. Um, so I shared this predicting fair use article on the last webinar, and it suggests what, what uh, we know, which is that um, fair use has been one of the most consistent exceptions in the past 25 years, and that it's backstopped by these good faith protections, so, so the, the risk can feel low. Maybe more important than that, though, I think fair use, and this goes back to the equitable thing we're talking about, because fair use centers an understanding of your socially valuable purpose rather than centering, did you understand all the subpart B rules? Fair use is a user's right as much or more than a lawyer's right in a lot of sense. And what I mean by that is, if you wanna know if you got your Teach Act stuff right, you really do have to read it all and understand it all and have a fairly sophisticated understanding of law and technology. If the question is, is it fair use for a history professor to include a video of this civil rights march, the answer to that question under fair use is determined not by a lawyerly well subsection D4 says, it's determined by the core values question, is this good pedagogy? Is this good teaching? And that's something that users are uniquely well situated to address, right? If, if I ask a professor on my campus if they're teach compliant, they might know the answer to that, but they really shouldn't have to be. But I ask them if they're a good instructor or not, and they're being honest, they can say, yeah, I really did have to do that, or well, I probably didn't need that whole movie. I probably could have done with these four scenes, right? So by centering the, the value stuff, the practice stuff, fair use centers the questions our users are best situated to answer. And if they're doing those things, they tend to win in court. That's the SAG article. And if they're acting in good faith and they're wrong, they have these good faith uh, protections, the sovereign immunity in some cases, 504 C2s, remittance of statutory damages, all those other things as well. So, so I wanna suggest that it, while it's fair to say that fair use is flexible, I, I don't think saying it's complex is quite right because one, it's, it's more certain than we think, and two, the, the complex questions are the sort of questions users are well equipped to answer, unlike many legal questions where it really does make sense to bring in a lawyer to understand, like, how, how does this DMCA exemption fit or not, right? Um, so so that's, that's the first part of the question. This is really complicated. I give up. Um, on the next slide, we get into the I give up part of that question. Um, and, and what I want to suggest there is a conversation I have with my counsel's office a lot on my campus, which is it's easy to think in terms of the risk on one side of things. The risk, if we're wrong and there's a lawsuit, is I'm afraid we're going to get in trouble. And when you do that, it's easy to miss the risk of using too little, the risk to mission, the risk to our students, the risk to what we're trying to do in this space, right? So, so when, we, when we say, I'm not even going to bother with fair use, the questions I had asked are, what teaching can you not do in that context? What resources should you be engaging with for your best pedagogy, but can't? What can we not present? What topics become off limits or a lot harder to talk about? Is it recent stuff? Is it stuff where communities have not created a large bank of open license materials, right? What are the lost opportunities in this context? And in particular, how, if we sort of 
tie that one hand behind our back? How do we fight with one hand behind our back against other resources, often commercial resources, that do have fair use in their tool bag? So don't just think about risk in terms of what if I'm wrong about fair use and the good faith stuff doesn't apply and, and, and down some horrible road. Think about the risk to your mission and to the, the value that we're trying to bring to our pedagogical practices. So that's the second thing I'd say. The third thing I'd say, and, and, and this is really what does keep me up at night, right? The lawsuit stuff doesn't keep me up at night, but the next slide really does. Um, because I think a lot about open pedagogy, and, and I saw the recent survey, a lot of you all did, that our, our, um, our science textbooks tend to be really, 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 really white, and that's true for commercial and for open as well. Most people's lived experiences don't come with a CC BY license. So if we say the only people we get to talk about, the only pictures we get to show, the only material that we get to engage with and that our students in open pedagogical practices get to engage with are things with an open license. Well, popular music that's relevant to their life doesn't get to be included. We're going to be talking about movies and cinema, but we can't show any clips from movies that don't have an open license in them. So we can do Cory Doctorow's and that recent one about how severe sucks and that's the only movie we can show, right? Um, there, there's this whole world of things that are happening that we want to be able to present in the context of our teaching materials and that we desperately need our students to bring to the conversation so that we can diversify the universe of ideas we're talking about. And if we opt out of fair use, we opt out of all of that stuff too. So it's not as scary as people think. There's a huge loss that it's easy to forget about if we don't rely on it. And then um, the last slide, or the next slide is, is sort of the one I want to point to, to, to sum up a little bit. Um, and I'm stealing from Peter here directly. I think it's a nice way of putting it. The fact of the matter is if we opt out of fair use, if we say fair use is too scary, I can't use it, eventually that will come true. If you don't use fair use for long enough, you create the norm that we can't use fair use. Because fair use asks this question, what does a responsible practitioner do in this context? Not using fair use, opting out, eventually deforms the doctrine to the point that it's harder to use fair use. The inverse of that is also true. When we confidently assert our rights to fair use and say, fair use is critical here. I need to feature different voices. I need to do the best job of teaching I can. That actually literally strengthens the doctrine. And I have an example here of how easy it is to use fair use. This is something I use based on fair use. I've, I've got my marking here on the bottom using the castle framework. This is an image. I think it, it is a strong fair use claim. Not so hard to do, really important for the sort of day-to-day -day work in open education that we do, and really critical to the ongoing mission of open education that we do more generally. So that's sort of my pitch, and I'm actually going to invite Meredith Jacob, who introduced herself earlier in here, to sort of bring another wrinkle to this conversation. Um, Meredith, th the myth that, that you shared with us that we ask you to, to sort of talk about here is this idea that, that fair use is uniquely uncertain, or it's the only place that there's uncertainty, that, that if we just ignore fair use, all the uncertainty goes away and everything becomes really easy. How do you respond, Meredith, to that myth listed on the next slide? Thanks, Will. So um, we have this myth that fair use is the only area where uncertainty exists. And on the slide after this, I think there's a couple of important points to keep in mind. Um, first is that, I mean, I think most importantly, is that we always in our work have to manage and tolerate some level of uncertainty. That um, uncertainty is relative, but that, for example, not everything marked with an open license is actually guaranteed to be openly licensed. Um, I would say that probably most people here, when they've done uh, image search in Google Images or in other big repositories of stuff where you can search by license type, you'll see some stuff where you're, you know, pretty aware that probably this, you know, screen capture from a recent movie or a comic or something like that may not actually be open license, that it could be licensed by mistake, that someone could have not understand how the licenses have worked. Um, similarly, there are lots of pictures on uh, Flickr where the image itself was correctly openly licensed by the person who took it, but it might include copyrighted things. So, you know, relying on license information alone, while I'm not telling you to worry about that, by doing that, you've already accepted that you tolerate a little bit of uncertainty out there. That, you know, we rely on people to think hard and to be responsible. And I think that's correct. I think that is good, reasonable, responsible reliance. 
but that fundamentally there are no guarantees. Similarly, within the world of copyright, there are no um, truly bright line rules about what is protected by copyright and how the sort of scope and function of a law works. That can include questions that we talked about, I think, with what you talked with Will and Carla in the last webinar, maybe about what is um, actually protectable, that ideas are generally not, that um, expressions are, you know, what is a sort of minimal thing that requires copyright. So in all of your practice, you're accepting a little bit of uncertainty to begin with. And in fact, that with fair use, you have, you know, similar uncertainty, but that that is important to sort of manage, that there are no experiences where you're going to have zero uncertainty. And just like you tolerate a little bit of uncertainty with Creative Commons licensing, that you accept that the, you know, OER that is labeled under a Creative Commons license after you've given it a look, that that OER is in fact under that license and you can proceed. Similarly, there is some uncertainty that you have to tolerate when you are working with fair use. As Will said earlier, fair use law has actually become even more reliable and predictable in the last 25 years, and that um, community-based processes like these best practices can give you a reliable and responsible frame to uncertain, sorry, to evaluate those situations, to mitigate uncertainty, and to behave in a way where your professional mission of doing high quality teaching is aligned with the uh, copyright decisions you make. To talk a little bit more, more about how those best practices work, how they're drafted, and the history of how they sort of work within the copyright system, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague at American University, Peter Yazzie. Uh, Peter's been working on these best practices for quite a while and can give you a little more information about the context within which they function. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you all for, for again, for having us. Uh, I'll be very quick. My colleagues at American University and I <clears throat> have been doing this work for roughly 15 years. And the work consists of helping practice communities to come together and adopt clear, useful guidance documents about when fair use operates and by definition, therefore, when it may not operate in their field of practice. So we started out with documentary filmmakers. That was an urgent and, and an interesting case. And we have worked over that time with, with 10 or 12 or 15 different practice communities. Depends a little bit on how you count. Art historians, K through 12 media literacy teachers, open courseware providers, um, academic librarians, communication scholars, and the list goes on. If you want a more or less complete list, I put in the chat a link to a resource that gathers these documents together in one place. Not all of them are there, but almost all of them are there. The and I would show, we have a slide, sorry, in two slides, just with Peter's points. We, I forgot. Oh, thank you so much. So, I've talked then about the first two bullets, how this all got started, who does it, um, it's how it's done in a, in a consultative process between copyright experts on the one hand and practice communities on the other. It remains to, to answer the question posed in the last bullet, which is, you know, how's it all worked? And the answer is, I think it's worked remarkably well. In, in two respects, one important and the other perhaps slightly less important, but nonetheless of interest. The important one is that communities have changed their practice, that they've become more aware of how they can employ fair use to achieve their results, to fulfill their missions, and they've started doing things, making films, publishing books, teaching classes, providing library services and on and on and on in ways that they were not before and that come closer to fulfilling mission than their more constrained former practices did. The other measure of success is, I guess, um, uh, less, less important but still notable, and that is over the years that we've been doing this, given the 15-odd codes that 
have come into being since we started, no practitioner, no teacher, no scholar, no librarian, no no one who has been operating within the four corners of one of these codes of best practices has ever been sued, period. I'm not saying no one has ever been sued and lost. I'm saying no one has ever been sued. And that's in part because one of the reasons these codes work is that they, they express a strong, centrist, community consensus. And rights holders think twice and thrice before challenging such a consensus. Another thing about the codes that's proved really uh, good, helpful, uh, is that they're very good documents for practitioners to use in convincing others within their institutions to let them make reasonable use of fair use in order to be successful. So you know, people use these documents to, to speak to their general counsel, for example, about what they ought to be able to do, or to speak to someone else who is in the unfortunate role of, of, of having to kind of police copyright on campus or in some other environment. And of course, the last and most important reason that these codes work so well is that they're backed up by good law. I've been doing this stuff for 50 odd years, and I want to reiterate a point that Will and Meredith have made already, and that is the law of fair use has never been clearer, more robust, or more predictable than it is today, thanks in large part to court cases that have been decided in the last 25 years. So this is a law you can rely on. And although it's true that fair use analysis is, of course, situational, it isn't in any sense, by virtue of that, unpredictable. Meredith, back to you. Thank you. Um... So as Peter had mentioned, we're uh, beginning work on a best practices in fair use for open educational resources that's designed to help uh, professors, teachers, authors, librarians, and others who are involved in the creation of OER understand and sort of systematically think through and evaluate the choices that they're making in that process. And we've done some introductory survey work and interviews for the process. And right now what we're doing is talking to people who create OER about um, how they think about the pedagogical purposes of including third party materials. And so as I think we'll talked about in the previous webinars, the purpose that you use, Will and Carla, the purpose that you're using something for is very important. So we're running these workshops over the next couple of weeks and we'd like to invite um, anyone who's on this call to consider joining us for one of those. I will say um, the workshops are really small and to sort of manage the attendance. We're asking right now that you don't forward this link to other people, but if you're interested, please, um, if you're interested in passing it on, please email us and let us know. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, for people who are watching online, if you're interested in participating with one of these sessions, um, you can email me at oer at wcl.american.edu. Um, and the workshops will help document the reasons that you do this and therefore the fair use analysis that would follow. With that, um, I want to move on and let us get on to questions. Thanks, Peter and Meredith. We, we have a lot, a lot of questions here, and Carla and I both committed in the chat to, if we don't get to your question in the next couple of minutes, to answer them afterwards online. So if, if you don't get an answer now, don't worry. An answer is coming your way. Um, did anybody among the panelists see a question that they really wanted to jump into first? Or did one of the moderators wanna, wanna serve one up that they thought looked super interesting and like a, a good one to answer now? There is a really interesting question about whether or not um, when you ask for permission for something, you can then include that in the OER, that that permission lets other people continue to reuse it. Um, my short uh, and possibly unhelpfully simple answer is that depends on what permission you ask for. Um, but I might ask people like, 
Carla or Will who have a little more experience working directly with OER authors, whether they wanted to add to that. Will, you want to take this first? Uh, sorry, I, I was answering a question in the chat real fast. Okay, I'll dive in if you want to finish that up. Um, I agree with Meredith. It depends on the context of your permission. When I'm having a conversation with any about anybody about permissions, whether it's a classroom use or OER use, I try to supply that rights holder as much information as I possibly can. And especially with OER, it takes some education, I think, to really help them understand this is going to be publicly available worldwide. Anybody can download and use it. We space the reuses. So make sure um, that we're being very forthright. Make sure that the terms we're securing address the use that we want to do, that we're including in this OER that will be made openly available worldwide. And then something Mil Will had mentioned earlier is properly labeling that so that our users understand that the permission we got might be a little bit different from what they need. So the permission I got to include it in the OER doesn't trickle down to every single person who wants to use that OER, generally. Again, it depends on the wording of the permission. Um, but that it could be that, you know, this work was used with permission. You may need to consider user rights or exception found in your law or seek your own permission if you want to reuse this work in a different capacity. So communicating what permission we got and considerations for them when they're looking to reuse the work. I hope that's helpful. And I welcome Peter and uh, Will to include more information there if you have additional thoughts. Well, no, I, I would like please. to jump in on a different question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a <clears throat> question that appears to have originated with Jonathan Poritz about burn, and it's a really good question. Um, the, it, re it relates to whether or not the burn convention simply permits countries to adopt educational exceptions or whether it requires them? And the answer is, it's the literal answer is the former. The Berne Convention allows countries to en enact educational exceptions, and almost all of them have, but they're not literally required. What they are required to do, however, by the Berne Convention, and what they have almost uniformly sometimes by this name and sometimes by other names, is to enact a so-called quotation right. And it is really the quotation right, which in the US is expressed through fair use, but which is expressed differently in the laws of other countries, that is often the feature of local statutory limitations and exceptions that is most hospitable to the kinds of things that people want to do with third party material in OER. You don't even have often to get to the educational exception. It's the quotation right that is telling you that you can insert that photo or those lines of text or that clip of video in aid of your educational objective. Thanks, Peter. That's perfect. Can I do one more, Barbara, and then Dash? Because I just want to build on that quickly um, to say I, I saw several flavors of um, if there's a CC license, does that preclude fair use? So, so if I find something that's licensed with a by NC, does that mean I can no longer rely on fair use? And I just wanted to make the point, as Peter said, these things work in parallel with one another. So, so you can say a CC license lets me do X, fair use lets me do Y, um, it's now in the public domain so I can do whatever I want, etc. These These stack as it were, on top of each other. They don't negate each other in any sense. I know there are a lot more questions, but we are over time, so I'll hush up now. But thank you all for the good questions. We will try to answer some more offline, uh, and I hope this won't be the last time we talk about these issues. I think they're really exciting, because I'm that kind of nerd. <laughs> thank you so very much, Will, Carla, Peter, and Meredith. This was fabulous today. Um, as Will said, we did have a lot of fabulous questions in the chat and the Q&A, and so what we're gonna do is compile that into a Google Doc. Um, have these professionals run through and share their answers in written form and then send that out when we have um, the recording of this webinar up on our YouTube page, which I'm also going to resend in the chat here to keep on your radar. So hopefully that will help address your questions, despite the fact that we are now out of time. So Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, also, like I said, we'll be posting the recording on our YouTube page, um, and we hope you have a fabulous rest of the day. Thanks.
Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.